Okay, welcome everybody to our webinar, Maryland Wing webinar about the Nike missile site. Uh, we have two presenters tonight, um, our Maryland Wing historian, Captain Patrick Wang, and uh, Chief Master Sergeant Tom Reed, who is our command chief. These two gentlemen are working on um, both the history, they'll be telling you both the history and how we're going to hopefully revive the Nike missile site. Just for those of you who already um, have been on or the, and those of you who are just now getting on, you can you are all muted at this point, but you can ask a question in your question box and we will try and answer you. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Captain, Captain Wang and uh, go, go for it, sir. Uh, well, thank you, Brenda. Um, and uh, again, on behalf of uh, Tom Reed and myself, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, webinar uh, about um, a piece of history, a piece of important history, our Nike missile site uh, at our Maryland Wing headquarters. Um, and for those who don't know me, again, I'm, as Brenda said, I'm your, uh, the wing historian. And uh, so I'll be going through a presentation here that talks a little bit about the background history of the Nike missile site. Uh, for those who are not uh, familiar with the history of either the program or the site itself, um, hopefully this will be uh, educational and maybe even a little entertaining, hopefully. So with that, without further ado, I'll go ahead and get loaded up and start with the presentation. So starting off here. Works. Hopefully, if my there we go. All right. Sorry for the delay. So, starting off uh, a little bit about the Nike missile itself. So, um, turning back to the early days of the Cold War, um, the U.S. Uh, kind of felt it needed that um, you know looking ahead at threats that were potentially coming online with with the advent of the jet bomber. Uh, the U.S. felt that there was a need for a, a continental air defense system to defend primarily against foreign jet bomber attack. That was the uh, that was the initial threat at that time. There was a fear of that uh, from the so burgeoning Soviet Union, and so the the uh, basically around the time of the end of the end of World War II and into the late 1940s, it was the U.S. Army um, that initiated what they called the Nike program. Developed several types of uh, high explosive and nucle eventually nuclear tipped anti air missiles. So there were three variants that were developed. First was the Ajax, which was a, um, a high explosive tipped warhead. Then came the uh, Nike Hercules, which uh, was the, uh, the nuclear tipped version. And finally, the Nike Zeus, which was not actually fielded but was developed and tested, but was uh, uh, the program was ended in about 1962 by then Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara uh, felt that the capabilities and the costs were just uh, too exorbitant uh, to to support the program. Um, so uh, eventually, though, about 265 Nike missile sites were constructed across the continental U.S., Hawaii, and Alaska. So this was a pretty expensive program, and um, obviously it was fielded all across the United States. And Hawaii and Alaska, so it was a big, it was a big effort. Uh, so here's a picture of the actual missile itself. This is the the Hercules variant. Um, and just an anecdote, um, you might, some people might wonder, like, you know, uh, why the army? Um, you know, I think that uh, there's maybe a, a conception that it's the Air Force that kind of owns um, anything to do with, you know, air defense or some, something like that. But actually, you know, at the end of World War II. Um, you know, when there was no uh, separate air force, it was the Army Air Corps. Um, at the end of World War II, when Nazi Germany was defeated, um, its rocket scientists basically were captured, and uh, many of them were kind of uh, volunteered to go work for the United States government. Um, and so that was the genesis for the uh, for the U.S. Army's rocket program. And as the Air Force uh, separated, there was definitely a rivalry that developed between the Air Force and the Army, and who owned basically. Uh, the rocket program and eventually the intercontinental ballistic missile, which obviously the Air Force won. Um, but obviously that's an inch separate history, but just a little anecdote. Um, and if anybody's curious about that, there's maybe a book or two I can recommend for those who are interested in that kind of history. So, um, so a little statistics. Here's the uh, Hercules variant again. Um, it's range, speed, weight. 
Um, and on the left is actually, I found this uh, neat little uh, uh, insignia shoulder patch for the US Army Air Defense Command, which was owned basically um, the Nike missile sites uh, and operated them. So. Um, I found this uh, slide kind of interesting. It's, it's uh, I can't really speak in depth to it, but basically it gives you sort of the, uh, what they call it, I guess the de detect to engage sequence of uh, the Nike missile. Um, and obviously there's a, um, a far ranging radar system that detects the target, um, a closer in targeting ranging radar that kind of feeds information to the launcher. And then after the launch, successful launch of the rocket or the missile, um, there's a tracking radar that homes into the intercept point. So that kind of gives you just a real um, overview basically of how the, how the engagement system worked for the Nike missile. Okay, so going straight to our site. Um, so granted, the Granite missile site, BA-79, was activated in 1954. And as you can see in this photo, uh, which is circa 1957, uh, for those who have visited uh, Woodstock and the Maryland Wake headquarters, if you kind of use your imagination and have been out to the field, you could probably imagine what this looked like back in the day. You could sort of envision some of the buildings are still there, so you could sort of just get a feel for what uh, this site used to look like back in the day. And you can see the, the missiles out there on the launch pads uh, erect, if, uh, erect in their launcher systems, ready to go. So Granite was one of several Nike missile sites that ringed Washington, D.C. Um, I think there was about 15 or 16 in the Baltimore, Washington area, and then several more in Virginia. Um, most of them are gone, uh, have been, you know, succumbed to development. Um, and I think uh, Nike, uh, the Granite site is, uh, is probably definitely one of the unique ones for sure, and that it's, it's really the site has largely been untouched since, since the site's been deactivated. Um, so the other unique thing was uh, Granite was considered a dump, what they called a quote a double site, which had three, uh, six underground uh, magazines, each with four missile launchers instead of the usual complement, which I believe was three magazines. In 1963, the operation of the Granite missile site was actually turned over to the Maryland Army National Guard, and from what I understand, that was one of the first uh, Army National Guard units to assume full operational control of a making uh, Hercules site. So this is a big deal because uh, instead of using regular army personnel, now you're turning it over to, um, you know, your quote unquote weekend warriors, Army National Guard to actually operate, you know, basically a, a nuclear armed nuclear site. Um, so that's kind of a new thing in, in Cold War history. And then about 11 years later, the grant site was deactivated in 1974 as basically the, the Nike missile program was, was reaching obsolescence. And there's other fat political factors going on that caused all the Nike sites to be eventually decommissioned by that time. So here's another photo of a uh, 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 Nike missile, the Hercules variant again, uh, in, erect in its launcher. And if you look a little closely at the uh, at the billboard in the front there, this is actually from the granite site from Woodstock, Maryland. So it says, you know, first missile battalion. 70th Artillery, Maryland Army National Guard, Woodstock, Maryland. So that's kind of a neat photo to find. This is probably from around the 1960s. And then here, this is a site overhead uh, view of the Granite Missile Site uh, circa 2001. Um, obviously, you can still see, uh, if you've been to the site, you probably you know, can still see the uh, main buildings in the upper left corner uh, that still exist and the condition of the site as is back then. And now you can see just a matter of almost two decades later, um, it still looks sort of similar, but you could see definitely the, the growth, the foliage, um, you know, Mother Nature is a pretty relentless, uh, you know, is pretty relentless in taking over, taking back, uh, you know, man-made objects and man-made sites. And so you can see the result of that just, you know, just from letting it go, this is what happens. And you can imagine if nothing ever happened and what the site would look like another two decades potentially, so. Um, and of course, um, this is not a part of the, our uh, Maryland Wink headquarters site, but obviously, as I mentioned before, there is a, a radar site as part of the Nike missile system. And just up the road, there's uh, what used to be a field where the fire control system and the, and the radars were housed. Um, there's a photo here, probably around the early 2000s, of the missile radar towers that existed, but all have been removed since. So basically, this site doesn't exist. It's just an empty field now. 
So some environmental history that is important to know. Um, so what happened after 1974? Um, so the site was licensed to the Maryland Army National Guard uh, from 1974 to 1992. Uh, during that time, they've had some, you know, um, removal of some old equipment and, and, and transformers. They've had some fuel tank spills. Um, and then from 1992 to 2014, the site was pretty much largely abandoned. Obviously, uh, for those who are familiar with the site know that we had a Maryland State Police canine facility. Um, that's a small section of the site. Um, that's, you know, hasn't really been used very much, but it's still there. And then um, uh, by 2001, basically all the existing transformers, power transformers were removed by that year. And then between 2001 and 2004, a total of 11 buildings removed from the site. And that probably includes the radar site as well. So there's been a lot of reclamation and getting rid of old buildings during that time. Then in July 2007, um, there was what was called a current condition site assessment, which was conducted for the US Army. And you know, just so you know, obviously, you know, this is a this is a site that housed rockets, rocket fuel, parts, uh, chemicals, solvents, and you know, it it some of it's leached in. So you can see that some of these statistics of lead, dissolved metals, subsurface hydrocarbons, gasoline, diesel, um, pretty high for for that area. So obviously, that's something to keep in mind. And all this information I pulled from the Maryland Department of Environment fact sheet uh, that was done in 2013, so it's pretty recent still. So why is it important to, to save the site? Um, well, it's you know part of our Cold War history. Um, you know, it's it's something that affected so many generations of Americans. Um, the entire country was involved. You could say in this, in, in effect, um, and it's also important important part of our national and regional heritage. So. You know, we had um, for, for several years, you know, Army National Guard folks who were manning these sites. And these are, you know, neighbors, um, you know, policemen, firemen, you know, part-time who wanted to, to do something for their country, uh, who just maybe lived down the road. So this is also important local history uh, for those who served in the, in the Maryland National, Army National Guard. And this photo is a, uh, is a, uh, I guess from a public uh, display that was done several decades ago. And what's interesting is the web link below is actually to a, to, to a link to a podcast that was done by WBEZ Chicago uh, Public Radio back in 2013. Uh, it's a 12 minute podcast that talks about um, whatever happened to the Nike missile sites in the Chicago area. Um, and some people were asking questions about that. There were some interviews. So if you have a chance, um, it's a really interesting and entertaining uh, listen. If you guys like listening to podcasts, uh, you might find it uh, pretty interesting and entertaining. So. And finally, it's really for future generations. Um, you know, this photo is taken from probably one of the best preserved Nike missile sites, which is the Nike Missile Site Museum at the Golden Gate National Park near San Francisco. Um, it's, it's a wonderful, and there's, there's gonna be some more about this uh, in Tom Reed's presentation, but you know this photo you can see here, um, you know, a person who looks like he might have served as part of the NECA missile program, giving a tour to a bunch of interested people from the public, uh, and it's really a part of you know, passing along that legacy um, and that heritage to, uh, to future generations. So I think that's part of the reason also is just also remembering what happened and finding ways to protect it so that other people in the future, other generations can enjoy um, that legacy. So um, I think that's my last slide here. So um, if there's no really other questions at this point, I'm gonna turn this over to Tom Reed and he's gonna go more into about the, the actual preservation work and ideas for potentially protecting our site at Granite. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over. So thank you very much. Okay, um, like you said, I'm Tom Reed. I'm the second half of this presentation and I'm going to start the slides and we're gonna talk about preserving the site. So hopefully you guys can see my slides okay. I'm sure Brenda will yell at me if, they're, if you're not hearing me or seeing the slides. So, so the proposal is basically we want to preserve and eventually restore the site to its original condition. 
So short-term goals. What do we need to do now? We need to preserve the site. What you're looking at right now is one of the old elevators. Like I said, there's six um, silos on the site, and this is one of the elevator um, silos that are there. You can see how overgrown it is, and it's getting pretty rusted. So what I'm hoping to do in the short term, in hopefully this year, is one, is get rid of all the brush and the trees on the site. Um, I have some pictures later on. Let me tell you, just go to the pictures and I'll walk through them. So short term, we want to get rid of all the trees brush that's on the site. Um, in this picture, you can see that's one of the entrances down to the underground facility. You can barely see You see the trees growing up around it. This is taken in the early spring right now with the leaves and, and trees all in bloom. It's pretty down there, but that's not what we want. So we want to go ahead and remove all the plants from the site. These buildings, we want to remove all these. They actually are knocked down. We had the uh, Air Force. The, some airmen came over and helped us. They knocked them down, but we, they still need to be cleaned up. And there's one more in front of this building that still needs to be de demolished. So we want to get rid of all the sheds. These were temporary sheds. They weren't part of the original site. They were put up later. So we want to get rid of them. There is old fencing around most of the site. We want to get rid of that. I had taken this stuff down. It's not too hard to take it down. Sometimes it's a pain to pull those poles out of the cement, but we want to go ahead and take all the fencing down and get rid of it. The three main buildings down there that you saw in the aerial shot, um, they need a lot of work. So short term, we just want to paint all the exposed areas, especially the ones that are wood, to keep it from rotting any further. Um, we'd like to be able to make sure all the windows and doors can close so we can keep the elements out of the buildings. And down on the, the site itself, there's a lot of um, metal structures. We want to go ahead and stop them from corroding, from rusting away. So we like to go ahead and, and sand them and then repaint them and hopefully repaint them in the colors that they originally were in. So that's the short term stuff. And so in, I have a later slide asking for your help to help do that. Um, want to do some work days and get out there and just and just take care of those projects so we can preserve the site. Longer term, want to start rehabbing it to make it actually presentable. So that's going to include painting and ring shingling all three of those buildings. The shingles are getting pretty bad on them, so they're going to need to be replaced. Like to repaint all those buildings. Most of them, the paint is it's chipping away. So we need to repaint and reshingle them. One of those buildings, and I'll show you in a later slide, is I like to make one of those into a display area that talks about the site. Um, but to do that, we have to clean up the inside, um, repaint it, move all the stuff that's in that building into another building after we clean up that building to make sure we can house that stuff. So that's going to take a lot of work. I actually like to restore one of the underground facilities. In my previous slide for a short-term goal, short-term action, um, I like to pump out one of the facilities. Um, as far as I know, all of them are underwater. The one that closest to the buildings is under like seven feet of water. So I'm hoping that maybe we can get the volunteer fire department down the road to come up with a pump and pump out one of them just so we can see what it, what it looks like down there. How bad a shape is it in? Can we keep it from flooding? What do we have to do to keep it from flooding? Um, can we dry it out? Can we restore it? So long term will be, can we restore it so we actually can go downstairs without Matt, our safety guy, freaking out? So that's the ultimate goal is we don't want Matt to freak out. Um, and part of that is the part of this, the site that we're not going to use is we would fence that off. I mean, long term goal is I want to be able to look at all six silos and all the up above ground facilities will be painted so it looks good. But we would just mow those areas and, and not worry about um, keeping all the soil off that part of it. So, and then finally, the ultimate ultimate goal would be to try to get a missile. We talked to an author of a book. I don't have the name of it here. Um, he actually wrote a book about the the, the silo, the, actually the missiles and the defense of the U.S. And he visited um, Granite, and he said that there's still some missiles to be had. 
So the ultimate goal would be able to display a missile on our site and then maybe open it up for the public, you know, once a month that they can come in and see what it's like. Because like Patrick was saying, this is history. There's a lot of people in the area who never knew that these sites existed, let alone knowing that a nuclear armed site or a, a site with nuclear um, missiles were there. So I want to show this, you guys this video. You can find it. It's really easy if you go to YouTube and just do SF-88 um, Nike missile site. I think it's the first one that comes up. I'm just going to play a couple bits of it. This is the site that Patrick talked about. Um, it's in the San Francisco area. SF, San Francisco, 88, and just so you know, BA-79, our site, BA, Baltimore. Took me a little while to figure that one out. But let me go ahead and play this. It's going to jump to the U2 station. And you guys won't hear anything. It's only music that they're playing right now. So here's the site. These are the launch rails. You see, it's Army restricted. This is the old guard post that's no longer on our site. You see, these are confidential. This site has a lot of this stuff. Here's one of the elevators coming up. And I'll stop here for a second. One of the things I'd like to do, again, longer term, or yeah, short term, is this is all metal. So I want to go ahead and get this painted. And I like to paint it in these same colors. The On the edge, the curb, that's cement. But I still like to go ahead and paint that. And you can see here's the rails. At our site, the rails are no longer there, but you can see the holes where the, the rails went. I don't think we're going to be able to get to our elevator work. It's been sitting under water for a couple of decades. Um, but who knows? Um, maybe the doors, maybe there's somebody out there who's really good at mechanical stuff when we get this working. So there's the missile. Again, I'm looking right now at the color schemes. So how do you paint it down there? So I'm going to skip up a little bit. Doot, doot. So here's underneath, coming down. Again, this is the what's currently flooded. I'd like to see what that looks like and what we could do down there. And then one last thing to show you. You can watch this on your own. These are what it looks like when you go in this the door, this door, and you look down. This is exactly what it looks like at our site. And this is exactly, all the sites were pretty much built the same way. So they all have the same basic construction. So I'm going to stop it there. There's another one. And after this, we'll send you out the link. There's a, it's a video that was shot um, showing the site in action. So it was made back in the 60s. Um, it's another good one to watch if you get a chance. And we'll send that to you. So let me go back to my slides. Oops, try that again. So what next? Um, right now, I'm looking on, for the short term. I'm looking for volunteers who can set up work days or come out for work days. Or if you have free time, come out. And I, I go out there when I have some time, and I just putter around on the site. Um, of course, Matt's now freaking out again. Um, we will have training before you go out there. We're actually going to have Matt develop a webinar, a little video we're going to record that if before you come out and do work on the site, he's going to give you a safety briefing on what you can and can't do and where you can and can't go. Um, but once you get trained, go out there and you can help um, work on some of the stuff. Even it's um, repainting some of the things, getting the, the rust off of them. Um, this Saturday, I plan on being there. Um, if you guys would like to join us, I figure about nine o'clock is when I'll definitely be there and come on out for a couple hours, work till you're tired. The wing said they would provide lunch as long as we know you're coming so they can um, plan for the round amount of food. So if you are interested, um, after the seminar or webinar, um, just drop me an email and um, we'll hook you up and we'll see you there. Longer term, oh, before I do that, I forgot I had this here. Let me play with my little markup tools. Is this is 
the, an aerial shot that we saw before. This is again before the trees came out in bloom. This area right here, they got some trees that are about 20, 25 feet tall. This almost, this is where, this is the kind of the area I'm kind of looking at to fix up first. And I've started cleaning off all the debris and it's been a lot of um, dirt just build up. So that's where the grass is growing really well. So I'm just slowly scraping that off. I'd like to, again, paint all the silos and all the little, we think this is, this, these are the, where the missiles rested. It's kind of the blast shield. Paint those, paint all the vents that are out there. And so, and just keep, fix this up really nice and then clean the, all the plant stuff from the rest of it. Here's the sheds we want to, that are, are knocked down, but there's a huge pile of stuff right there we need to burn. Here's the other shed we're going to demolish. And then the three buildings that we want to fix up is first is this one. And from what I've been told, that's where they used to fuel the missiles. And if you look at the original picture on in Patrick's, it wasn't a building here. It was a big, there was a, a big um, raised mount, mound of dirt here, protective like blast shields around it. And that's where they would fuel it. I was told that this building was where they would assemble it, the missiles. Now it's, it says maintenance facility right here. And then this one, I can't remember, I think was admin, somebody else can tell me differently. Um, so these three buildings we want to fix up. This is one I'm thinking would be a good for the display area because it still has a, a, a working um, hoist in there. So again, this would be a good one to fix up. We would just have to move all the stuff over to this building because that's currently being used for storage. Fix this one up and so we could use this for storage. And then I know the leadership at Wing wants to use this one maybe for like a bunkhouse. So now that I drew all over all over that, let's see if I can erase it. Hello. Erase all drawings. There we go. I just gotta get it to work again. There we go. Okay, longer term. I think to, to do a lot of the bigger projects, we're gonna need to set up a committee. Um, a group of dedicated people who want to work on this. Their job is to set up free fuel work days. I think the most important one is that second bullet, fundraising. We're going to need money to do the things we want to do. It's not going to be cheap to um, reshingle and repaint all those buildings and fix them up on the inside. It's not going to be cheap to do anything with the underground facility. It's probably going to cost us money if we want to try to get a missile. So we need money. So we're going to need help there. Um, advertising. Um, can we get the word out to the CAP members, to other things, other people that can help us, to let the the granite community in the area know what we're doing? And then Patrick's doing some really good work on the research, but maybe he could use some help. Can we reach out to people in the local area that maybe served there? Do we have any Air Na um, Army National Guard folks that actually um, were stationed there? It'd be great to do some interviews with them and talk. So those are the future things. If interested, this is my CAP um, email address. So just tread at cap.gov. Um, that's my phone number. Again, I work at NSA, so I can't take my phone into work with me. So don't try calling me during the day. And then half the time, I can't figure out where my phone is anyhow. So um, email works best for me. But if you're interested in it, we really could use your help short term. If you'd like to work outside, fantastic. If you like doing painting, we could help you get help there. If you dislike destroying buildings, there's still a shed that needs to be destroyed. Um, longer term, if you want to join our committee or working group or whatever we want to call it um, to help raise funds and organize this, again, we would love to have your interest or get your involvement. I think that's my last slide. Well, thanks for joining us. Look at that. Brenda, are you online? I am. Here I am. Okay, and I'm back. Patrick, do you want to show your face again? I'm here. Oh, All right. there he is. 
So again, if you want to ask any questions, you can use the, the, the little question functionality. If you also, if you raise your hand, I'm going to have Brenda, if you watch the question one, I'm going to watch the attendees. If, if you want to raise your hand, we're we'll unmute you and you can ask your question that, or if you have comments you want to add in, raise your hands and, and join in on the conversation. So to raise your hand, you should see a little, little hand on your dashboard and you would just click on that. It lights up on our screen so we know who it is. Okay. Oh, we've got one. Okay, it's Matt. Oh, let's see how we can do this. Hey guys. <clears throat> um, so just to add a couple uh, on on the, um, besides the three of them up there, I, I'm probably one of the few people that knows quite a bit about the history of the site, mainly because I was there before everybody else. Um. And we had to go through a lot of work to get it to where it is even today. And it's nowhere near where I think anybody would really like it to be. And there's some still cool parts that I think we, that Dr. Tom about really would like to keep and, and find a way to, to, to show it off. Um, and there's just a lot of stuff that needs to be done. And please, you know, heed my warning. Uh, if I say that there's something that's unsafe, please, you know, heed my warning with it. It's there's a reason why. Uh, so there's still a lot of things down there that we that we have to keep under a lot of safety considerations because of just the nature of it until we can get it all cleaned up again. So. Okay. Thanks, Matt. And again, I really, I really, Brenda and I were talking about this. I think it really would be good for you to do some kind of safety brief that we okay. can present to the folks on give us you know, the warnings, the do's, the don'ts, and maybe even use one of those overhead ones saying, okay, these are the areas you don't want to go into right now until we go in and fix them up. So I think that'd be a good idea we can do in the, in the soon. That that works. And uh, I mentioned in the question remarks, um, the book is Rings of uh, Supersonic Steel. It's by uh, uh, Mark uh, Burhal, and he was actually at the site and toured it. Um, and really gave us a lot of history and knowledge of the Nike missile system. Um, he gave me a copy of his book and signed it for me, and I've read through it. It's a great resource of a lot of history to the Nike missile system and defenses back then that were back during the 1950s to 1970s. So if you want to look it up, I think you can find it on Amazon, but we can probably find the link and send it to you guys if you want it. Yeah, it is on it is on Amazon. I, I we we looked it up at one point, and the the mm -hmm. author actually spoke at our wing conference of what about three years ago. It was 2015. 2015. Okay. Well, Matt, while you're still on, there's a couple questions coming in, and there and you could probably respond to them as our wing safety officer. So, um, Rick is asking if there are any issues of toxic materials to be concerned about, and let me just continue on because they're all connected. Dave Williamson wants to know about lead paint and its asbestos, and Kai von der Linden wants to know if anyone has run radiation tests on the site. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer kind of I'll, I'll, in them in order. Um, so from a standpoint of um, any environmental hazards that are down there, um, the last report that uh, that Patrick discussed was done in 2013. It was in a Maryland Department of Environmental study that was done, um, and it pretty much took care of a lot of the core components that were in there. Most of it was all diesel fuel um, from a couple leaking tanks. Um, most recently, I can tell you for a fact, the two oil tanks that were actually up by the admin building and the training building were actually removed by the state. Um, because they were deemed insufficient and were not being checked, hadn't been checked since 1983. Um, so those were pulled. Um, and then about two years ago, we actually had a diesel oil tank that was on the outside of the maintenance building down there that sprung a leak, and that involved us siphoning stuff out, out of our septic vault um, to get all that diesel fuel out. And that was fresh diesel fuel. That was not old. 
it was actually fresh because they used it to mow, use it for the lawnmower when the big lawnmower used to be on the site. Um, this is probably about three years ago when that was still on the site before the state removed it. Um, as far as lead paint and asbestos, um, from the best of my understanding is that there is no known asbestos that's on the site. There might be the floor tiles themselves, but as long as they're not disturbed, they're not a problem. As long as they're covered, they're not an issue. Um, as far as the lead paint goes, that's the huge unknown that we don't know, um, especially with all the paint that was down on the lower part of the property. It has most definitely not been repainted since probably about 74 or 75. Um, so we don't know when it was last painted and if it was painted with lead-based paint or not. So um, it's something I could do a test of just to make sure and let you guys know. It's I could easily figure out how to do it and do it for you guys. Um, and radiation de detection. I don't think there's any radiation that's left down there if there ever was any to begin with that was even remotely susceptible to any human at the time. Because it was all contained in the warhead and they never accidentally exploded a warhead on site. So I don't think we have to worry about that. Okay, thanks Matt. That, I knew you were the right person to ask, answer those. I try. <laughs> You do well. Any other questions? We got a couple of hand hand raises, so let me unmute Matt or Rick. Rick, you raised your hand. <laughs> you raised your hand and then you asked the question in writing. Okay, so Rick doesn't have another question. Yeah, they are listening. Speak, Rick. They are listening. <laughs> Raise your hand, Rick, if you if you want to say something. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Oh, okay. Mike Mike Starr um, has just just asked if there was ever a test to launch. Interesting. So, Patrick, hmm. maybe. I don't. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think there was at that site, as far as I know. I don't think, um, you know, when it was an active site, um, an operational site, they don't really do any type of testing. They might have tested, you know, obviously doing drills to actually like erect the missiles, assemble them, um, bring them up, up out of the magazines, do maintenance, things like that. But I, I don't think that, they, you know, that being in an operational site, they would do testing. Um, you know, obviously, I've read a little bit about um, the Nike missile program, and you know, obviously, the testings they did, for instance, for the Zeus program uh, that was killed uh, back in the early 60s, uh, that was done out in the South Pacific at the Kwajalein Atoll um, testing facility, which I think is still they do still do missile testing out there occasionally, um, from what I understand, but no, not, not any type of testing for as far as I know. So. Okay, any other questions, comments? Okay, uh, Rick, I believe, has his hand raised now. Well, he doesn't, but uh, let's let's unmute Rick. And uh, where'd he go? Yeah, once you're unmuted, mine drops down to the bottom, oh. Brenda, just so that you oh. know. Okay, Rick, you're on. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Sorry about that. First time I've done this venue. This is uh, pretty cool. So, oh, um, good. Glad you like it. Regarding funding, um, my family and I, we've been to the Titan uh, to, uh Museum down in Pima County, Arizona, which was, it's, uh, it's the only uh, restored missile site from the Titan II era, um, which it was pretty cool because I actually served down in the site there when I was in the Air Force as a security uh, team. But uh, the, what, I'm, what I'm thinking about is that museum is actually run by and funded by Pima County. Is it possible that you might find uh, county participation or desire mm -hmm. for the county to uh, jump into the restoration and possibly run it? That's a good question. Patrick, you might want to kind of mention about your efforts with the Patapsco Greenway. 
Sure. Um, so yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Rick, for the question. Um, so for the past on and off for about a year, roughly, I've been working with, um, there's a, a heritage area, which is um, near, very close to where our Woodstock, the Maryland Wing headquarters site is. It's called the Patapsco Heritage Greenway, which is a part of a network of heritage areas that are funded and supported by the state of Maryland. Uh, to protect various um, cultural and natural sites, heritage sites uh, throughout the state. And Patapsco is, is actually the closest one to us. It's about seven miles is the closest boundary limit to it. Um, and I've been in communication with them. We've actually written a letter uh, to the Maryland Heritage Areas Authority uh, and also to the Patapsco Heritage Area to see if they would be willing to extend their boundaries to cover our site. Um, we're, and besides our site, there's actually a couple other sites of interest nearby, which would make sense for them, I think. One is a, um, there's a historic old African-American church in Woodstock uh, that was down from, I think, pre-slavery days, pre-Civil War, uh, not pre-Civil uh, pre War, and also um, a Quaker theological seminary site, which is pretty old. Um, so those are pretty nearby us. And um, the advantage of being part of that greenway, uh, if they do extend the boundary, is that would access that would give us access to potential state funding and other type of grant money to be able to do this kind of work. Um, so at least we would have an avenue for that type of uh, way. You still have to apply. Um, I'm sure there's some kind of bureaucracy or bureaucratic process to go through, but at least that would give us um, our foot in the door, so to speak. Because uh, as of right now, it would pretty pretty much be. Um, you know, uh, whatever we can gather on our own, um, individual efforts, um, kind of just out there on our own. So hopefully this will be a, a way we could be a good first step to access some funds uh, to do things we want to do. Like, for instance, um, to even become like a designated as part of the, uh, like a national historic site uh, requires funding. Um, there has to be surveys that are done of the site. Uh, to kind of do reports that go to, uh, you know, the National Historic Site Commission, National Park Service, to be able to say that this is a historic site and here's the reasons why. Um, and so uh, all that, unfortunately, requires money too. So um, hopefully, you know, these efforts and effort, individual efforts that we can come up with or discuss here are going to really pay off eventually. Um, so as long as we have the interest and the willpower, um, I think we can do it. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Well. Well, we're all in caps, so bureaucracy doesn't intimidate me. Um, so we, we have one more question from, from the room here, Staff Sergeant Malamut. The what? Go ahead. The room. Uh, yeah, um, Jonathan Malamut here. So have you considered using uh, GoFundMe to try to get funds for the restoration? Um. As of right now, no. I mean, I don't know if Brenda or Tom, you want to chime in on that idea or not. Uh, I guess I was just, uh, my initial thoughts were um, trying to uh, see if we can get under some kind of big state umbrella <laughs> uh, to get us started. But uh, that could be um, also an idea, too. It's a lot more flexible. Um, it requires a lot of effort, I know, for marketing and promoting, um, which um, I don't know if that's not exactly my forte. But, um, you know, I think that's a great idea as well if people are, have some kind of marketing ability um, and and some efforts to kind of spread the word, make it do some publicity for it. That would be good. Great, thank you, Tom. You all got anything to say about that one? Yeah, I think right now it's. I mean, we just in the early stages. I mean, we got wing leadership buy-in to go ahead and do this. Um, they're all for it. They think this would be great. Um, and next step is setting up that committee to figure out how do we raise funds. I think short term we could we can do a lot on our own without having a lot of money. I mean, most of it's going to be need to buy paint um, hmm. just to preserve the site. I think when we really want to start fixing it up, that's when the money comes in. And I think if we do the short term stuff, make it look better, then we can have a better advertising campaign. We can show what um, what we've done and what we want to do. And I think maybe a Kickstarter could be a way to get some money or GoFundMe. Well, so there's always there's always the uh, you know, the opportunity maybe to hit up various places like Sherwin-Williams and wherever, they're always looking for opportunities for advertisement and, and getting their face out in front of the community. Um, just another, you know, Home Depots and, and such. Uh, my son's an Eagle Scout, 
And I know having run Eagle projects as a scoutmaster, uh, businesses are, are, are many times willing to support community projects. I know there's a lot of paid here, but you know, when we take it in smaller amounts, uh, just kind of, you know, bite off one bit at a time, might be able to get it done. Oh, yeah. So uh, um, sorry, I was me... saying, we're, we're talking about painting and I have a question here. Um, Carlos is asking about um, during and when the painting is done to restore the silos externally. Will countries that surveil by satellite know that this is a static museum site and not an active site? Uh, yeah. They're, so just because we're painting it is not going to do anything. Now we start bringing down military vehicles down there. They start seeing as loading missiles. If we bring that one missile on display, they might get a little going, what's going on here? Um, but for now, I think there would be pretty, we're pretty safe that they're not going to think we're an active site. Okay. So I did see a, a question from Sherry talking about high schoolers and volunteer hours. Um, I think short term, I think we have to work out the logistics of um, who can help us you know, because again, we're going to talk about liability. We're good with CAP members working for now. We got recovered. Um, we'd like to bring the airmen from the local squadrons. They can come over. They're covered because um, they're Air Force and we're Air Force. I think we're going to have to work through as, you know, can we get other volunteers to come in and work and what happens if they get injured? So I think we just have to work through that with national and stuff and what kind of liability and who covers what just to make sure we we're good to go for um, safety concerns. Right. Um, the yeah, safety is going to be the the biggest issue as, as well as insurance of covering people on the site that are not CAP. So Patrick, I think this is more your question. Um, this is from Bob Midkiff. It says, other than internet research, have you had the opportunity to dive into the National Archives for documentation or pictures? Mm, um, the short answer is not yet. Um, I think that's something um, would be nice to do as a longer term project, especially if we want to do some sort of aesthetic displays um, uh, of those sites that we could put up at, uh, at the admin buildings uh, for people to come by eventually in the future. Um, and I think the National Archives is a good resource. Um, there's surprisingly a lot of stuff on the internet, surprisingly. I mean, even with just um, the Grant Nike missile site alone, there's at least a couple websites of amateur historians, uh, those who are just kind of uh, really into the topic, uh, Cold War history of uh, posted, you know, all those pictures I found were basically sourced from those sites mostly. Um, but um, I think for a longer term effort and um, for those who are in really interested in history and developing their historical research skills, um, yeah, being close to National Archives and other places like that are probably um, really good resources to actually exploit some time. Um, so yeah, the short answer is no to yet, but I think that's a good idea for the future. So. On a side note, I think we need to go out to um, San Francisco and go visit the site. I think that should be a good CAP event. So, and just to let you know, um, down in um, the Everglades, there was also a, a, a Nike site there, but they couldn't put it underground. So they actually had this, that was the only site out of all of them that was an above ground and they had them in buildings. And that one is actually, you can go in and, and tour that. They have um, certain hours you can come and you can tour that site. So if you ever go down to Florida, that's worth a trip. Okay. okay. Any other questions before we wrap this up? Um. And again, if you are interested in helping on Saturday, I will be there and send me an email and I can tell you what tools to bring and Matt can give us a safety brief before we start. Okay, um, just so you know, we just got one, one last uh, comment from Dave Williamson. It says, sometimes water acts as a preservative. Be prepared to preserve metal once you pump out the water. So uh, it's a good idea. We had kind of thought about pumping it out at the same time we burn the sheds up just so we have a source of water down there. Uh, I don't know if we can get it all together at one time. However, um, we're going to wrap this up, I believe. Is that right, Tom, Patrick? Sounds good. Okay, so Sounds what's going to happen now is uh, you, when, when, when you leave this and we, we, sh we stop the webinar, there's going to be a survey that's going to pop up for you. 
And there's three questions on there relating to whether or not you're interested in helping us preserve our site, do some more research, help with fundraising, manual labor, whatever. They're short answer questions. If you could answer that, then we'll know where where things stand. We appreciate you all coming tonight and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening.